So today, let's dig into what really happened in July 1789. Um, and let's start by picking up from last week's episodes. So listeners will remember there was a social crisis born of the horrendous weather, the bad harvest, the hunger, the frustration, the fear that has swept through so much of France as people begin to starve. There's a financial and political crisis that goes back for decades to do with uh, the French government running up debts to pay for its foreign wars, its political system, unlike, say, Britain's, not really having a mechanism that allows them to do that. France has been on the verge of bankruptcy. Louis XVI has recalled the Estates General, this great gathering of the commons, the lords and the church, um, which has then morphed into a national assembly and basically made a move to, to take sovereignty from the monarchy. And we ended last time, 20,000 troops are moving towards Paris from the frontiers, many of them Swiss or German speakers, so feared and, and hated by much of the Parisian population. They are advancing on the capital, triggering panic in the streets of Paris. And there's a sense when you get to the beginning of July 1789, everything is building towards a peak, the food prices are rising, um, the panic on the streets, the sense of paranoia is growing all the time. And people is famously yeah. the um the, the the bread price reaches its pinnacle on the fourteenth of July. It does indeed. It? it does indeed. About fifteen sous, uh, having been normally about eight sous. So in other words, bread has doubled, and for a lot of mm. people, that means destitution, cost of living crisis, a cost of living crisis with knobs on. And a lot of people at this point, even though that that cost of living crisis is driven by acts of God, which is to say the weather, people are already looking for scapegoats and that is a real theme of the entire french revolutionary story so a guy a deputy uh in the new national assembly a future member of the committee of public safety called bertrand barrer said on the 19th of june that the food shortage was the result of the disastrous projects of the enemies of the people enemies of humanity and they need to be discovered intimidated and punished and there again a real preview of what is to follow. But brilliantly, there is a kind of the people's hero, uh, rather unexpectedly, is a banker. That's it? right. Which yes, not what you see today. Yeah, no, exactly. So this is somebody, again, we talked about last time, Jacques Necker, the finance minister, a Swiss Protestant. He's the one person that most of the French public view as their saviour. But as we said last time, Louis has been losing confidence in Necker. And at five o'clock on Saturday, the 11th of July, Necker and his wife leave Versailles for good in a coach. He has been sacked by the king um, in a very kind of underhand means. Necker was about to sit down to have dinner when he got a note telling him he had to leave um, France immediately and not go via Paris. He goes to Brussels. And actually, Necker then does something, Tom, which I think shows that he, you yeah. know, it would be nice to kind very of... Very admirable. It'd be nice to, to, to sort of have a revisionist view of Necker. But Necker gets to Brussels the next day and he writes a letter to the Dutch bankers, Hope. And he says to them, um, I promise, I put up £2 million in my own money as, as security for grain shipments to the people of France. Even though I have been fired, I'm still good for the £2 million. I mean, that show, he's a pretty decent... Admirable. Yeah, yeah, decent fellow. Now, the King's advisors, they'd sacked him on a Saturday for... They thought they were being very clever. They thought that um, because the National Assembly wouldn't meet on the Sunday, there wouldn't be an immediate reaction and they would therefore be able to manage it. But what they didn't bargain for, they didn't think it through because on Sunday in Paris, a lot of people obviously are not working and they have right. taken to the streets. There are a lot of sightseers. There are peasants who've come in from the countryside to kind of go into the city. And a lot of these people have gathered at what's called the Palais Royal which is a part of the city, a great complex of our, uh, sort of arcades and cafes and shops that is under the jurisdiction, not of the king, but of the Duke of Orléans. Right. And we've talked about that, haven't we? And talked about how, uh, for instance, when we were talking about the, um, the abuse levelled at Marie Antoinette, that a lot of this is coming from factions within Versailles, within the royal family. And the Duke of Orléans, he is Louis's cousin, mm. and although he's absolutely committed to the causes, I mean, he will end up, um, uh, he will end up voting for Louis's death. Yeah, he's not, he's um, not a good man, I think, the Duke of Orleans. But he, um, I mean, there's a sense in which even now there is a slight quality of the the kind of the internal royal faction fight going on. 
but it's obviously spiraling massively out of that. Massively out of control, yeah. So there are huge crowds that have assembled in the Palais Royal, and thousands of people. And the news arrives by about midday that uh, Necker has been sacked. And the crowds are very cross and angry. And they're all shouting and people are listening to... There would be a tradition of kind of orators standing up and giving impromptu speeches on the street corners and things. And about th- by about three o'clock this afternoon, a large crowd, it's said to be thousands of people, has gathered around one particular cafe where a young man is standing on a table shouting at the crowd. Uh, the Cafe Foy, it's called. And this young man will be very familiar to people who've read Hilary Mantel's book, A Place of Greater Safety, because he's really the hero of that book. And he's called Camille Desmoulins. He's 26 years old. He came from Picardy. He's the kind of slightly spoiled son of a lieutenant colonel who had sent him to Paris for his education. And at the Lycée Louis Le Grand in Paris, uh, Camille had become great pals with a man whose name will definitely be familiar to a lot of listeners, Maximilien Robespierre. So they're a real sort of inseparable duo. And Desmoulins is not a deputy at the Estates General, but he's very much of that ilk. So he's he's obsessed with the Romans, with Cicero, with liberty, with virtue. He's written a poem, an ode to the Estates General. <laughs> what a ter- so he's a very Sandbrook figure. Yeah, oh, thank you, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> great. Exactly. <laughs> Um, he's a kind of Shelley, isn't he? He is. He's um, a wannabe Shelley. Poets as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Exactly. That's his, He's a young, All long-haired that. idealist. He's everything I dislike in a man, Tom. <laughs> um, and he... I look forward to you being fair. <laughs> to um, well, Sharma says he's a, an exponent of the breast-beating, sob-provoking <laughs> declamation then in vogue at the Palais Royal. His style, a tone of virtue militant, mingled with the patriotic martyrdom exemplified in neoclassical history paintings in the salon and on the stage. So you can absolutely, the, the, the type, he, in 1968, at Columbia in New York or in Paris or the London School of Economics, he'd have been the first one to do the well, sit-in or, or, or whatever. Yeah, but or 1848. Yes. I mean, he's there at the beginning of that tradition, isn't he? He is, he? indeed. The, the long-haired poet's throwing cobblestones yes absolutely he is so um Desmoulins stands on the table and he says um to everybody you know Necker has been kicked out you the nation you've been we've been insulted and he says um Ozam, Ozam, to arms to arms and he and he supposedly he grabs the leaves from a tree and he says let us all take a green cockade the color of hope and he kind of wears these <laughs> leaves and everybody so that's says a marketing strategy that doesn't work out. No. And everybody but everybody at the time says, Oh, brilliant, love it. And they everyone's shouting bravo and people are kissing him and kissing each other. And they 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 take kind of green ribbons or they take bits of branches or or of sort of leaves and stuff, anything green. And then they go out into the streets of the capital, out of the Palais Royal, into the streets of the capital. Some of them um have wearing kind of mourning clothes to mourn Necker's um, dismissal. They burst into theatres. It's very kind of Just Stop Oil or something, isn't it? They disrupt performances yeah. and they say, how can you, you know, there's a crisis on this, is a moment of mourning. How can you, you know, everyone should go out in the streets and mourn the departure of Necker. They, they invade a, a wax museum. Run by, I mean, this is so meta. Yeah. So meta. Run by a guy called Philippe Curtius. Now, Philippe Curtius um, is the inspiration. He is the patron of a, of a little girl called Marie, who ends up becoming Madame Tussauds. Madame Tussauds. Yeah. The wax Museum. Yeah. And in the wax yeah. museum, Philippe Curtius' wax museum. Lots of heads, They've they? got a head of the Duke of Orléans and a head of Necker. And the crowd grab these heads and they're kind of parading around in the streets. I know. It's, it is very... I mean, it's unbelievable. It is. It's <laughs> so yeah. bizarre. Kind of so, so the whole story is bookended with heads. It is. It is indeed. So anyway, the crowd rampage through the streets, shouting and waving the heads and all this. And they get to the Place Vendôme. And at the Place Vendôme, some of these troops are there. They're the Royal Allemand. They are the they are German-speaking troops. And they try to clear the square. And basically, this degenerates into fighting between these dragoons and the crowd. And the fighting spills over from the Place Vendôme into the Place Louis XV, which is at the end of the Tuileries Gardens, this great sort of And that's garden. the Place de la Concorde now. Yes, this great, so, um, yeah. exactly, Tom, yes. This, this, this great kind of pleasure park, royal pleasure park in the centre of Paris. 
Now, the gardens are filled with middle-class Parisians on a Sunday stroll. Women, children, families and whatnot. And the fighting, which it has now become, between the crowd and the dragoons basically spills right over into the park into where all these people are strolling total chaos people the crowd are grabbing things from kind of cafe terraces and throwing them at the soldiers chairs kind of stones bits of statues and because as people are fleeing in panic screaming and stuff the word spreads around the city the germans and the swiss have gone mad and they're trying to kill the, they're massacring the people and at that point another military detachment these are called the Garde Française, um, so the French guards. They arrive on the scene to try and protect the people from the German and Swiss troopers. Now, the Garde Française are an infantry unit, and they are very different. They are young men. They are often provincial from northern towns, um, and they have proved in recent weeks extremely unreliable. So they have been pamphlets have been circulating among the French guards. We are citizens before we're soldiers. We are Frenchmen before we are slaves. In other words, you know they have been, as it were, uh, they've been. I was going to say tainted. That's not the right word, but they have the the, the rhetoric of liberty and virtue has permeated them as it has so many other aspects of, of French it's, life. It's like the police taking the knee. Yeah, they're the police 2000. taking the knee exactly. So. Together, the rioters and the Garde Française actually drive the cavalry troopers out of the Tuileries Gardens. And at that point, the royal commander in the city, who is called Baron de Bessenval, he gives the order to all his troopers to evacuate effectively the whole of the city rather than fight. Because he, he, he knows he's lost it. Because he, and he's, he says, and he's frightened, thing. rightly, that he says we cannot trust our own soldiers to 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 hold the line. They they are breaking and defecting to the rioters. So in that moment, the city is lost to the authorities, and that then is the cue for a kind of um, well, there's no other way of putting it, an, an orgy of destruction, Tom. So or. Uh, a, a, a toppling of symbols a, of oppression, a carnival and, of uh, liberation, tyranny, a carnival of liberation. <laughs> so the um, so as the royal troops withdraw to the Pont de Sèvres, a bridge to the west, um, the crowd invades uh, gun shops, armourers, and so on, and they force them to hand over whatever weapons they can find. They've also many of them by now armed themselves with daggers and clubs, even kitchen knives, and they head to the north of the city where there is this great wall, a customs barrier. Because remember, we said in a previous episode, France at this point has a lot of internal um, duties, internal economic barriers, protectionist barriers, and custom, and literally customs barriers. And this is the most famous one. And it's built by uh, Lavoisier, who is the, the, the greatest chemist uh, in France. And he has done it because he has invested in this kind of tax farming company. So therefore, with this wall, they can, you know, regulate the um, the goods that come in and out of the of, of, of the city. And he's doing that obviously to raise money. And and this will not look good in due course. And Lavoisier will end up guillotine. But it is, I think, I, I always love this story. I actually did a school project on Lavoisier. Oh no way! So uh, he's yeah. So um, this is he's always been close to my heart because because. Although he's undoubtedly part of this kind of exploitative framework, he is also, of course, a brilliant chemist. He's the guy who basically disproves that there's this kind of weird element supposedly called phlogiston that uh, kind of results in explosions and things. And he says, no, it's all about oxygen and stuff. I may, I'm slightly paraphrasing here. Chemists may be able to refine that take on it. But also he is investing a lot of the money that he is making in charitable causes. Right. And among those is prison reform. He's very, very keen on improving conditions for prisoners. And the other, rather topically, bearing in mind that this is going out in the the, the fortnight of the Olympics, he's very keen on purifying the water in the Seine. All oh, right. So, yeah. so it's a kind of weird nexus of the Ancien Regime that it's it, it's exploitative, it's oppressive, it's enlightened, and it's compassionate, all in one kind of confusing hall of mirrors, well, Dominic. His hall of mirrors. History is complicated, Tom. People are complicated, aren't they? Yeah. It is um, complicated. So the, his wall, I mean, his wall is an amazing thing. It's 18 miles in circumference and 10 feet high. You know, it's a really, if it was standing today, you, you'd go and see it. 
as it would be a tourist attraction. Anyway, it's not standing because the crowd demolished the wall and they demolished 40 customs posts, which are at intervals around the wall, and they and they burn all the records from the customs posts. Now, burning the, the records, people are doing this in the countryside at the same time. They're breaking into castles and chateau and things. It's very like the peasants were Exactly, burning the feudal records of their own kind, the, 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 the evidence, as it were, of their own subordinate status. So this is what people are doing um, outside Paris. And they're doing this all night. Now, back inside the city, of course, there are a lot of people with a lot to lose. There are the propertied middle classes, basically the people who up till now have been directing the revolutionary process. And a lot of them are extremely worried about the fact that the army has vacated the city and law and order is completely breaking down. And there's a group of royal officials um, that, that huddle around a guy who's effectively the mayor. He's called the Provost of Merchants, the Prévost de Marchand. His name is Jacques de Flessel, and we will come back to him at the end of this um, at the end of this episode. Spoiler alert: He does not come to a very happy end. And the mayor basically says, "Listen, we need to um, rally the forces of order, and we will do this at dawn on the thirteenth of July. We'll sound the tocsin, the churches." Uh, the bells will toll an emergency signal, uh, sort of a slow toll of the bell. We'll, we'll fire cannons. There will be drums. And these will call out representatives from the electoral districts to the Hôtel de Ville, the city hall. Um, and we will meet and we will decide what to do. And presumably this will have a very calming effect. This on is what they're else. hoping, yeah, madness. Because <laughs> as soon as the toxin starts tolling at yeah, dawn, bells and cannon, people are like, what's going on? And everyone pours out into the streets thinking there's the city's under attack from the army or, or who knows what. Now, at the Hôtel de Ville, the representatives of the electoral districts arrive and they agree to form a commune, a, a sort of uh, an, a, an informal city administration to run their own affairs. The commune will become one of the great power bases in the French Revolution, although nobody, of course, knows this at the time. And they also say there are there are now mobs ro roaming the streets. There are also bands of vigilantes roaming the streets. We should regularize all this with a militia. They call it, um, entertainingly, the garde bourgeoise, the bourgeois guard. And this is what becomes ultimately the National Guard, again, a key player in the revolutionary story. And they've been wearing, of course, Camille Desmoulins' um, green, green sprigs. Green sprigs, exactly. And they say, well, this green business is, is rubbish, not least because green is the symbol of one of the great reactionaries, the king's brother, the Comte d'Artois. And they say, we can't be wearing his colour. Why don't we wear the colours of Paris, red and blue? So that morning, they, they swap their cockades for red and blue cockades. And we will discuss the symbolism of cockades a little bit later. Um, so meanwhile, the, the, the anarchy on the streets is actually getting worse. That morning, uh, rioters sacked the convent of Saint-Lazare. They took loads of... Which is where Beaumarchais had been. Right, busy. exactly. A nice bit nod yeah. back to your thing about the marriage yeah. of Figaro, Tom. Exactly. They, take a, they find there a lot of food, um, wine, vinegar... 25 Gruyere cheeses, <laughs> uh, which is exactly what I'd expect to be in a monastery, frankly, and yes. and a large dried ram's head. I mean, who knows what you'd be doing with that? Is that the, the bit of spaces for a yeah. soup? Who knows? Well, I don't know. I mean, so monasteries and convents are always the setting for pornographic fantasies. They are, so. exactly. About, the about, regime. about cheese. Who knows what's going on about there? Um, so anyway, they take all this stuff and they say, oh, well, this absolutely proves the privileged classes, the monks, the priests, the the bigwigs have been hoarding food all this time. And that's, of course, only inflames them more. And the drive to get weapons is now, they're desperate to get weapons because they think they're going to come under attack. They they ransack a royal storehouse. They get loads of halberds. Uh, we had a few halberds in our yeah. British elections episode, so it's great yes. to have halberds back on the show. Crossbows. They've got a cannon that was given by the King of Siam. I love this. To Louis the Fourteenth, the silver-lined cannon that was basically <laughs> a toy, a toy cannon, life-size toy cannon. Anyway, they've got this cannon. Can I think decorated with elephants. Yeah, almost think? certainly. This uh, this Thai cannon, bizarre. Um, they they go to the um, the great sort of military hospital, Les Invalides. This is back when I say hospital, it's a place where old soldiers. So that's where Napoleon ends up. Yeah, there, where he where went to I, retire. I filmed there, Dominic. Have you? Oh, I've never mm. been to the Les Invalides, Tom. 
I really should go and pay my respects to Napoleon. I think everyone I have stood next to his tomb and been filmed pondering. Were you? Sort of in a Napoleonic manner. Yeah. Were you dreaming about invading Russia, leaving your troops behind as you'd left them behind after invading Egypt? And cursing the British mastery of the sea. Exactly. Cursing the nation's shopkeepers. Um, yeah. Well, uh, at the... At the um, but obviously at this point, he's not there. No, the Avalides um, managed to sort of uh, keep them away for the time being. Meanwhile, that guy, the mayor, Flessel, is, is sort of... He's he's playing what seems to be a very strange game. People are saying to him, where are the arms? And he's sending them off to different parts of the city where it seems like there's obviously not going to be any weapons. And people are starting to be suspicious and thinking, is he trying to, is he playing a double game? Is he just trying to buy time by sending some wild goose chases? But all that day, the 13th, there is a sense of kind of increasing disorder. Um, and then dawn breaks the following day, Tuesday, the 14th. And the bread price, not surprisingly, given the chaos, has now reached its all-time peak. So it's now about 15 sous. And women who are going out to the markets to get bread are incredibly angry and saying, you know, this is intolerable. Uh, we, we can't eat. We must, you know, we, we must take matters into our own hands. So that morning, the crowds are bigger than ever. About 80,000 people return to Les Invalides. They They seize, they break in. Scenes of tremendous chaos, kind of stampede. There's a crush. People are being crushed underfoot. They get muskets, about about 5,000 muskets. They take out about 20 cannons, and they're passing them out among the crowd. But there is one thing they don't have. They don't have any gunpowder. They don't have anything to basically make the cannons work. And so, Dominic, is there anywhere in Paris that might have a ready supply of gunpowder? There is one place, Tom. And that place is the Bastille, the, the great fortress in the centre of Paris, and now the crowd turn their attention to the Bastille. So the Bastille, Tom, you will know, because you did a wonderful episode about the man in the iron mask, that the Bastille is not quite what we think it was. So in our imagination, the Bastille is this towering Gothic castle. You know, Well, that's how it's shown in the paintings. In the paintings, it? it's, 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 it's looming over the city. It's this yeah. terrible symbol of royal oppression, the embodiment of despotism and tyranny and whatnot. Now, it, it, well, it's Gothic, isn't it, as well? Because this is the kind of the period of Gothic fiction. Yes. And it's a transplantation of a sinister baronial pile in the Alps or something right into the middle of exactly. Paris. But that's not actually no, not what really. it is. It's, it's a bit of the, it's got a bit of a Tower of London quality to it, I suppose. But it's quite squat. It has eight round towers and it has it does have walls that are five feet thick. But it, it had been built in the Hundred Years' War as a defence against the English, I'm proud to say. And Charles the Mad, Charles the Sixth, had converted it into a prison. Well, we'll be looking at this in, in, in the Hundred Years' War. series we're going to be doing on yeah. Henry V in a few weeks' time. Exactly. Um, but it was Cardinal Richelieu, in the 17th century, who really said, let's use it as a, as a prison for prisoners of state. And the people who were sent there, uh, as you described in your episode that you did on The Man in the Iron Mask, there's a thing called a lettre de cachet. And this is a kind of sealed letter um, approved by the king uh, in which your crime is often not really nearly even named. But basically, if there's a lettre de cachet, you can be sentenced uh, without any process, without any trial, um, you can be basically thrown behind bars. So people are obviously up in arms. They see this as a you know, symbol of arbitrary government and despotism and absolutism and whatnot. But there are kind of three three kinds, really, aren't there? So there's there's um, people who are seen as engaged in conspiracy against the monarchy. Yes. Of whom whoever he is, the man in the iron mask, would be the exemplary example. Um, and there are writers... Whose, whose works are seen to be seditious. So the most famous of these writers is Voltaire, the great kind of wit and philosoph who actually writes the story of the, the man in the iron mask and basically kind of invents it yeah. as a, 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 a symbol of royal tyranny. And then there are um, kind of basically people who are seen by their own families as trouble. And again, there is a, a famous archetype of this, a literary figure, who we've also done an episode on, and that is the Marquis de Sade. That's right. So delinquents, whose own aristocratic usually, whose own families basically petition the monarchy, please can you have my son locked up? He's totally out of control. I mean, that's what it is, isn't it? 
it's like sending your if you, if today you sent your child to um I don't know uh, to a sort of sanatorium or something or to a, or to a clinic you know to a or military school yeah exactly that kind of thing and actually it's quite a, a kind of mark of status isn't it if you're a writer or to be sent uh, to the Bastille a rebel yeah to be sent there because that's what Beaumarchais finds so humiliating when he's sent to Saint Lazare that he isn't sent a to lesser Bastille. prison yeah and yes. actually the, the conditions in the Bastille I, I when I read up on it it reminded me of the prisons that Dickens describes like the Marshall Sea or something so it's all a bit Dickensian. It's Sharma described compares it to an overgrown lodging house with guests with guests living in different rooms according to their station. You can go into if you remember the public, you can actually walk into the Bastille. You can go in and sort of there are shops on the inside. There's a garden. The governor has a vegetable garden, so you can have a stroll and stuff. And and inside, further inside, there's the kind of warren of rooms where the inmates are kept. And the conditions are actually not really that bad. So the extraordinary thing is you are better off inside the Bastille than the vast majority of French people who live outside it. So, Well, the Marquis de Sade lives quite well. I mean, he's able to write his yeah, novel. and You have alcohol. And have wine and yeah. he sends his wife out to get him cheese. That's and right. He has 133 books when he's in there. And he has a desk and he has dressing gowns. He has aftershave. He's allowed all these kind of treats. This is the norm. There are there are card games among the. There's a billiard table. Um, there's a, a wonderful writer called uh, Jean Francois Marmontel. He was asked what was the food like in the Bastille, and he said, um, "I always remember an excellent soup, a succulent side of beef, <laughs> a thigh of boiled chicken oozing with grease, a little dish of fried marinated artichokes, really some fine croissant prayers, a bottle of old Burgundy, the very best mocha coffee." So. It's it's a kind of cross between a, it's more like a hotel than a prison, um, and the demonology of it was invented by writers to criticise the Sir regime. Voltaire. Yes, the most Voltaire. famous is a guy actually called Linge, who was a barrister who was sent there, and we don't really know why in 1780, and he published a book called Memoirs of the Bastille, and this is your classic kind of gothic nightmare. You know, the clanking chains, the door crashing shut behind you. And he invented the idea, really, that the Bastille was this kind of living tomb, that everybody in it was the walking dead. They would never be Well, heard he must from be drawing again. on the Voltaire. I, guess, I suppose to some extent. As well. I mean, it's kind of been laid. There's, those ideas have quite deep roots. They do, and they're actually so successful, those ideas, that the government themselves have decided that the Bastille has to go because it's basically bad. But even though it's fine... It's kind of bad publicity to have it. So by the 1780s, they have a plan to redevelop the Bastille. They're going to build a park instead with a column and fountains in the middle. And there'll be an inscription that says, ironically, Louis XVI, restorer of public freedom. Uh, yeah. Of course, that part, <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> I mean the the kind of the the shades of irony, I know. the 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 veil, the totemic episodes in the French Revolution are amazing. So, so the Bastille has has featured in in people's imagination in the days leading up to the fourteenth of July, because, partly because of the Marquis de Sade, actually. So he's in the Bastille. He's been following all the news from Versailles. He's really into it, isn't he? And he's been shouting political harangues from the window. Yeah, because he takes the thing that he pees into, yeah, kind of metal. A funnel. Kind of uh, funnel. Uh, and he uses that to shout out revolutionary slogans. Exactly. And he says, the governor is planning to... I'm in here with hundreds of inmates, and the governor is planning to <laughs> kill us all. And this is a complete fantasy. And the governor... So he gets bundled off to a lunatic asylum. A lunatic asylum. Sharon he's got to go. He's, he's a real pain. Now, actually, we talked about... The, mentioned the governor. So... The Marquis de Sade was kicked out nine, day, nine days ago. And the governor in those nine days has been getting increasingly worried, as you might expect. His name is Bernard René de Launay, and he is 49 years old. He was born in the Bastille. His father had been the governor as well. And basically, he's a very, very dutiful, um, humdrum, you know, uncontroversial civil servant, the guy who runs the Bastille. He's not a bad man. He's not a torturer. He's nothing like that. He's just kind of an, a boring official. He doesn't cackle evilly. He doesn't. He doesn't. Fettering people in dripping dungeons. Not at all. And he's been given this gunpowder to guard. The gunpowder has been sent to him, 250 barrels of it. And he's been told, you know, don't let anyone have it. He has been sort of making vague preparations, like moving the cannons to the embrasures. Uh, he's told his men to gather 
some stones to throw at people if they try to get in and bits of iron mongery and stuff. And I say his men, he has 82 old soldiers, like pensioners, the avalid as they're called. And, and they are just loafers. They're completely useless. They're not going to really be at all used in a fight. And he's also been sent 32 Swiss guards. He has enough food to last him two days and he has no water supply whatsoever so when he sees this giant crowd advancing towards him he yeah, thinks oh, for, yeah for god's sake like this is the last thing i need now this crowd later ends up being um sort of dare i say sacralized tom there are 954 of them and they are aged between 8 and 72 and they're known officially as the vainqueur you might say that all Frenchmen are vanker one way or another, won't you? But um, anyway, uh, that's a subject for a bonus episode. So most of these vanker are artisans from the Saint Antoine neighborhood, the neighborhood around the um, around the Bastille, and they are joiners and glaziers and cabinet makers and locksmiths. So because they ended up as these great heroes of the Revolution, we know loads about them. Only one of them is a woman, a laundress called Marie Charpentier. Most of them, historians have really done tremendous work kind of analysing their background. Most of them had not been born in Paris. So that gives you a sense of just how transient the Parisian population is. How many migrants have come from the countryside for work or for bread and are now angry and resentful? In a city like Paris, people are going to die of disease. And so the population cannot be maintained without this constant influx of people. Um so they are angry, resentful, hungry. They're also frightened. There are lots of rumours that the, the army are, are preparing to retake the city. They're desperate to get this gunpowder. Anyway, so they've assembled, a thousand of them or so, shouting and roaring outside the walls of the Bastille. Um, more happily for Delaunay, two delegates arrive from the city hall, from the Hôtel de Ville, and they say, look, we've come to see you. And he says, well, funny enough, I'm about to have... Um, I had to have my breakfast, <laughs> dinner. It seems, yeah, it seems it's <laughs> 10 o'clock. So it's it's described as his dejeuner, but it's more of a brunch. He's about to have brunch. And and he says, why don't you come in? So these guys go in and they have this enormous, I mean, obviously it's France, right? They have this enormous meal, which goes on for hours. And the crowd become very restless. What, what are they doing? Well, if they're all starving to death right. outside. And of course, we know what they're, they're eating in the Bastille. Like they're having an excellent <laughs> soup, a succulent inside of beef, a thigh <laughs> of boiled chicken, oozing with grease. They're having all this. Yeah. Brilliant. The crowd get very restless. Another deputy arrives called Thurieu de la Rosière, and he goes in to see uh, Delaunay. And by this time, he's got a very firm list of, of demands. He says, we want all your guns as cannons, as well as uh, the gunpowder, and you must allow our new militia, the bourgeois guard, to take over the Bastille. And Delaunay says, look, I, I, I can't do that. I mean, I've, I need instructions from Versailles, I've been. I've got my orders. You know, I'm doing my. I'm just doing my job. I don't want any trouble. But you can't ask me stuff that I can't deliver. Turio says, "I understand where you. You know, I understand where you're coming from. I'm not happy about it. But I will go back to the Hotel de Ville and report back, and and come and find out what's what's going to happen." So Turio goes back to the Hotel de Ville, and there all these sort of electors and officials are, are huddled together, and. They're chatting for about an hour about what's what are we going to do about the Bastille, and actually their attitude is mm, we don't want a, a massive affray in the centre of and Paris. Dominic, Go on, Tom. Just to be clear, at this point, their concern is with the Bastille as a source of ammunition rather than its role as an emblem. Yes, of royalty yes, abs yes, they are. That is what they want. They want the gunpowder. They want the guns, but they're not talking about you know the Bastille as the Gothic castle and stuff. I mean, they can see the Bastille. They know what it is. But they've been talking for about an hour. Um, it's 1.30. Um, Tichio is going to be sent back to the Bastille with a loud hailer to kind of address the crowd and stuff, when suddenly they hear there's this enormous explosion and the Hotel de Ville literally shakes and then they hear this, ex this, this further explosions, gunfire, and it's all coming from the direction of the Bastille. So what has happened? Well... While Turio and his friends have been meeting in the t city hall, the crowd outside the Bastille have actually run out of patience 
and have just decided to take matters into their own hands. And some of them have started to burst into that outer courtyard with the vegetable garden and the shops, shouting, give us the Bastille, give us the Bastille. A load of them climb up to the top of a perfume shop, which is next to the gate that goes into the inner courtyard. And there's a drawbridge, which is closed. They cut the ropes holding the drawbridge up. Now, this is that classic kind of mad crowd behavior. The drawbridge at this point falls open very unexpectedly and it crushes people underneath. One person has died. The rest of the crowd don't give a damn about that and they just run over the drawbridge, presumably further flattening this poor man. Um, there are soldiers up at the top who are shouting, stay away, stay away, we don't want to shoot you. The, the crowd think they are saying, come in, come in, we won't shoot. <laughs> so they charge in and the soldiers start, the Swiss guards start shooting at them. Now the crowd believe, quite wrongly, the people further behind say, oh, they must have lowered the drawbridge and let us into the inner court courtyard as a trick because they wanted to shoot us down like dogs. And they go ballistic. The crowd is now stampeding further into the Bastille and the fighting kind of breaks out in earnest. And what then happens, uh, of course, rumours spread. People, you know, Chinese whispers. People are sort of saying, oh, they're, 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 it's all kicking off at the Bastille. The guards are shooting at our people, at the crowd. Um, there's a guy who's called uh, Hulin, Pierre-Augustin Hulin. And he runs out and he gets a load of guard Francaise, French guards. And he says, the criminal de Launay is assassinating our fathers, our wives and our children. Will you let them be slaughtered? So these guard Francaise arrive and they've brought with them some cannons. And one of those, Tom, is that Siamese cannon. Oh, brilliant. With the elephants. With the, well, the elephants, I think, are a figment of your imagination. No, no. But I'm let's sure imagine we, it with sure the elephants. Yeah. Um, uh, which was a present for Louis XIV, and they aimed these cannon at the gates. So it's total chaos inside the Bastille. Delaunay, the governor, is obviously very distressed at <laughs> what's happened here. And uh, he, he, oh, he's enjoyed a nice breakfast. Yeah, well, he's, it's true. He did get his brunch. <laughs> but he yeah. is, um, I mean, Tom, it's fair to say, the last brunch he'll ever have, sadly. Um, <laughs> he w just wants to basically the whole thing to be over with honour. And he wants an honourable surrender and no more bloodshed. He sends a note. He he sends a note to the leaders of the crowd, and he says, um, "Look, I've got all these barrels of gunpowder. If you don't stop attacking, I will blow up the gunpowder and the fort. I'll blow up the whole thing, right, sky high." They don't want to give in to this ultimatum, and in fact, his own soldiers say, y I, "Yeah, yeah we, we don't. Not a good yes, idea. We don't want you to blow up all the gunpowder and us with it." And so, eventually, Delaunay, you know, his that this wheeze of his has failed, and he says. Fine, uh, yeah, let, let's call it a day. And he lowers the drawbridge that leads to the inner courtyards. The attackers now swarm over this drawbridge. Some of them, are de I mean, even though he's basically surrendered and let them in, they're determined to have their sort of moment of glory anyway. So they climb the walls and they hack down the gate, which is a, a bit kind of unnecessary. And by about five o'clock in the afternoon, the siege is over and there are white flags flying above the Bastille. And they think they are going to find uh, victims of royal despotism chained up in dungeons, do uh, they? Of course they do. I mean, don't forget the Marquis de Sade has been telling them that this massacre was impending. And for years, as you said, going back to Voltaire, people have believed that the, the Bastille is, is, is rammed with the victims of despotism, with the free so thinking... How many did they find? There are seven people in the Bastille, Tom. Seven uh, prisoners four of whom are genuine criminals who are forgers uh, who cannot be romanticized at all. One of them is one of the... But they go free, do they? Yeah, the forgers do go free, I think. One of them is a, a sort of one of your posh libertines, a guy called the, Com the Comte de Solage, who'd been locked up at the request of his own family for bad behavior. And two are um, lunatics. So... Of the of the lunatics, as they so as they are called, um, one of them is just obviously completely mad, and the other one is is probably some sources say English, some Irish, but I think it's generally agreed he's Irish. People he has a long white beard. Yeah, doesn't people he? call him Major White. 
He's, he's, he looks good. He's the only possible candidate that they have that they can say they've rescued from this massacre, a symbol of liberation, because he's got. And he this thinks he's beard. Julius Caesar, doesn't he? Yeah, they take him, they put him on their shoulders and carry him around the city. Hurrah! Look at this man. Now he thinks he's Julius Caesar, <laughs> so he's very confused by the whole thing. He's kind of waving at the crowds, and I think the next day they take they take him and lock him up in a lunatic asylum again. So actually, he was probably better off in the Bastille with his with his fine foods and his billiard table. Anyway. Just on the Bastille itself, this is obviously very disappointing from the revolution's point of view. So they have to completely reinvent what happened and what they found. The revolutionary artists pour out prints and engravings that show torture chambers, you know, iron maidens, men in iron masks, all of that kind of stuff. And also the battlements being much, much larger. Exactly. Than they really were. This, this extraordinary sort of. Uh, Helm's Deep style siege, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is not really what it was. It's, it was a, more like a sort of, it was more like a kind of, there was an element of the riot of football hooligans, I think, in the uh, Taking the Bastille. French listeners will be shocked by this, by the way. But the, um, do we have any? No, so it's not an issue. Uh, they find some bits of old armor in the sort of cellar and they bring that out and they say, torture equipment. They find a printing press, torture machine, all this kind of stuff. Bastille tourism in the next few days becomes a huge thing. So they basically, former warders turn up. And they're giving you a guided tour of the cells. Um, posh women will have themselves locked in overnight so they can enjoy the full Bastille. Spiders yeah, and rats. toads and stuff. Didn't the guy, um, th there was a guy who, who made friends with his rats. Is there? In a cell. I didn't know that. Yeah. A sort of rat you wrote fancier. A book about it. Yeah. Wow. Who knew? The rats became his big friends. Okay. The, um, the really interesting story, and you can read up more about this in um, a lot of the French Revolution histories. Simon Sharma is really good on this, for example. There was a, a guy in the crowd who was a building contractor called Pierre-François Palloy, and he's very entrepreneurial. He basically gets the contract to demolish the Bastille, but he, he makes tons of money from organizing guided tours, lectures, all this kind of stuff. He builds a France's first revolutionary altar from chains and manacles that he claimed to have found in the Bastille. And then he becomes the great entrepreneur of Bastille merchandising. So he puts together a, a traveling revolution kit that um, his kind of, uh, his his reps, his sales reps, take to every, one, every part of France, every one of the 83 new yeah. departments. And it includes a big chest of, of, of souvenirs <laughs> Literally, inkwells that are supposedly made from fetters, paperweights in the shape of the Bastille, daggers, snuff boxes. So, Dominic, it's very like um, uh, the way the Berlin Wall, you know, the chunks of the Berlin Wall were sold. Enough chunks of the Berlin Wall down. to make millions of Berlin Walls, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly the same. Yeah. So, and re sort of cross between, it's a cross between medieval relics and basically modern souvenir tat, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Palloy's uh, souvenir kits. Anyway. Which is the hinge between the past and the present. That, that's history, it? Tom. What can you say? Um, anyway, uh, that's to jump ahead. Let's go back to the afternoon of the 14th of July. So what happened to all the defenders? The Swiss guards were initially unharmed because they'd taken the uniforms off, so nobody knew who they were. Some of the the Avalide are very, very harshly treated. There's a guy, a, a good example of this, there's a guy called Becar. And this, I think, is a quite a scary warning for what lies ahead. Becar had been one of the key people in dissuading Delaunay from blowing up the gunpowder. Um, and so actually, you know, he, he the crowd should have been quite grateful to him. But as soon as they get inside, he opens one of the gates and somebody cuts off his hand. The crowd believe that he must have been a jailer. So they wave his hand around and they go, they, they put a key in. And he's presumably still got it's the key. He's got the key in, yeah, sorry. He's got the key because yeah. he's opened the gate. So because of this, they, they they parade around the city carrying this poor bloke's hand. Anyway, he he manages to live to the end of the day. But then somebody, again, misidentifies him and says, oh, I think that bloke was one of the guys who was firing the cannons at the people, which he wasn't. And so he ends up being hanged along with some of his comrades. Mm, that's unfortunate. Which is very unfortunate, but not as chilling as something that has always stayed in my mind ever since I first read it, which must be, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, which is what happened to Governor Delaunay. Remember, I, I said, he's just a functionary. 
he was ca- he wanted to kill himself he was so shamed by the dishonor of surrendering the fortress but he was stopped from doing so by a grenadier and the crowd sees on him and they drag him out and they drag him towards the hotel de ville um he's being dragged through the streets people are spitting on him and kicking him and and on all sorts a, a, a horrible scene they get to the hotel de ville and then they say, "Well, let's how are we going to let's kill him in a really amusing baroque way." And there are some people who say, Let, "Why don't we tie him to a horse's tail and drag him through the city, and he will die by being dragged over the cobbles?" Because that's kind of the kind of thing that um, royal executions do to awe and, and intimidate the the masses. And so I suppose there's a, there's a kind of element of paying royal officials in their income. Exactly, exactly. And there's a guy called a pastry cook called Deno. Who says no? We'll take him into the city hall, the Hotel de Ville, and we will um, we'll, we'll give him a kind of a trial or something. And to Lornay, who at this point is you know is battered, bruised, covered with blood, you know, crying, whatever, he says, "Enough of this! I, I just let me die!" And he lashes out furiously and kicks the pastry cook, Deno, in the groin. And at that point, the crowd kind of close in on him, daggers drawn bayonets and they st- people are in a frenzy and they stab and stab and stab and kill him poor Delaunay and then people sh- shoot his body as it lies in the gutter and then somebody gives Dano the pastry cook a sword and says you you have the honor of cutting off his head and Dano throws the sword aside I don't need the sword he says and he gets out a, a, a pocket knife and he then kneels down and saws basically saws this governor's and so, head off and so this story began with wax heads being paraded yeah and now real heads and now real heads and they put his head on a pike the crowd are all laughing there are women in the crowd kind of that this is what shocks some witnesses kind of cheering and singing um and they parade around now the the mayor is it's been in the hotel de ville all this time uh jacques de flessel this is the double crossing uh, people suspect of double crossing them they people sees him as well they say afterwards they find a le- they found a letter from Delaunay in his pocket, saying you know hold out I'll, uh, let's distract the rabble. Whether this is true we don't know. Of course there's no evidence for it now. Flessel too was taken outside. He was basically ripped to pieces by the crowd, shot in the head, his head cut off, put on a pike, and then the crowd parade through the streets with his two heads on pikes. So this is what's been happening in the city. That evening it starts to rain and anyone who knows anything about riots and mobs knows that basically the single best way to to, to end a riot is for it to start raining so like the chartists in exactly got rain got rain there was no revolution yeah. so the national assembly the, the everything has died down in paris but the national assembly of course is still in versailles and that, that evening as the rain is falling the a guy called the vicomte de noailles bursts into the national assembly in versailles which is hours away but ride or whatever, and says that all this chaos has kicked off in the city. And actually, the National Assembly are not jubilant. They are anxious and shocked. It is clear to them, to some of them, even now, that this process that they thought they were controlling until a few days ago is spiraling well beyond their ability to restrain it. The king himself has been in the palace all day. That is why, in his journal, he writes the word rien nothing because it's a hunting journal and he has not done any hunting which in itself is a sign of how you know things have changed yeah. for him so it's not him being obtuse no and failing to recognize the significance no. of what's happening there's an apocryphal exchange somebody comes in to tell him this in the evening another um another duke and it tells him the bastille is for and louis is supposed to have said is it a revolt and the guy said no sire it is a revolution again i think that's got that's too hollywood really um but the next day the 15th of July, all morning he dithers and he's not sure what to do, but eventually he goes in to he decides he should go and address the National Assembly personally. He goes in with no guards, with no retinue, just with his two brothers, and he says, obviously things in, the, in this capital are totally out of control. I'm going to withdraw all troops. Please help me. Um, he says, help me to assure the salvation of the state. Help me to send a delegation to Paris to sort things out. And the deputies are really impressed by this. They're moved by it. They start cheering and they they be like, brilliant. The king has shown his his willingness to work with us, to recognize, you know, our importance. And he's clearly going to play decently. 
So at two o'clock that afternoon, they send this great cortege, this procession of deputies in carriages to Paris. And they are led by the president and the vice president of the National Assembly. The president is an astronomer called Jean-Sylvain Bailly. And the vice president is a man that our American listeners will know, the Marquis de Lafayette. Tremendous character. Well, do you like the Marquis de Lafayette, Tom? I do. I like him more than you do. Yeah, I, I, I've, I got, no, to I've got no time for him at all. So he's a rich, he's a, he's a trustafarian, he's a rich aristocrat who went for his gap year. But he's year gone off to fight in, a, in the American yeah. Revolution. He's a tax, very tax cheat. He's a tax, <laughs> very friend bravely. of tax and cheats. He, he hangs out with George Washington yeah. and basically he becomes the son that George Washington never had. So he's, he's still only 41. He's come back to America, to France from America. He's a massive celebrity. He's been elected to the Estates General. He's a kind of liberal reformer, Lafayette, very much typical of his generation. Um, I have to say, Tom, his biographers, and, and, and especially if they're not American and not as keen on him as you are. So one biography calls him... <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm keen, I, and I but quote, I, I like his, his dash and his swagger. Uh, one biography calls him vain, naive, immature, and egocentric. And my favourite one What's not to like? is from the uh, <laughs> Histoire et Dictionnaire de la Révolution Française which was compiled by French scholars in the 1980s for the bicentenary. <laughs> and the entry of Lafayette describes him as an empty-headed political dwarf. <laughs> so, yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying he's a, he's a political genius, but he has swagger and dash. Yeah, and you and love that. He knows, you love that. You, I, you love a political a dwarf. Kind of, yeah. um, <laughs> I, uh, if he dresses well. So um, they arrive at the Hotel de Ville. Huge cheers, all this kind of stuff. Um, Bailly, the astronomer, people say, you be the mayor of Paris now. So he's going to be the mayor of Paris. And Lafayette is, accepts the command of this new militia, the bourgeois guard, the national guard as it becomes. And, it, and it's um, Lafayette who says, why don't we, as a mark of compromise and you know the coming together of all these different forces, we will add to the red and blue colours of Paris the white of the Bourbon dynasty. So Dominic... I put it to you. Yeah. Is this the action of an empty-headed political dwarf? Yeah, it's a terrible. Or a flag. man with an eye yeah. for political symbolism well, that has endured to the present well, day. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it depends what your your views on the French flag, Tom. Do you like the old flag, uh, I, the flag of tradition, honor, and uh, and and the the age-old customs? I have a lot of time of for a the of a proud people. Or do you like a boring th tricolor flag? <laughs> I don't rate a tricolor flag personally. You know my methods. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, this is the origins of the of the French flag. The next day, um, the 16th, so only two days after the fall of the Bastille, the king holds his final ever royal council. His brothers um, and his relatives, a lot, you know, a lot of them have basically now given up on the whole process. Um, they, they Again, they say to him, you should leave. You should get to the frontier. Get loyal troops. This is all out of control. But actually, some people say, now we're not even sure we can get there in safety, that safety cannot be guaranteed. We just have to hope somehow stick this out and hope we can turn this around. But Dominic, you know who does go? go tell me. The uh, Duchess de Polignac. Yeah, Marie Antoinette's, Antoinette's uh, friend. Marie Antoinette's great friend. Yeah. And who doesn't go is our other great friend, the Princess de, de Lombard. I know. Should have gone. And, uh, Should have gone, Tom. Princess yeah. de Lombard. <laughs> As events will As prove. As events will prove. So quite a lot of them do yeah. go that night. The Comte d'Artois, uh, the Prince de Conti, the Prince de Condé. So these are the first émigré. This is so for the first time you have people now fleeing France for the frontiers, determined to, to, that there'll be no compromise with the revolution. But Louis himself does not flee. He instead, the following day, the 17th, makes an extraordinary gesture. He decides to go to Paris himself uh, in an undecorated carriage, wearing a plain undecorated coat. And he is greeted at the gates of Paris by the new mayor, Bailly, the astronomer from the uh, National Assembly. And Bailly hands him the keys of the city and he says, um, these are the same keys that were presented to Henri IV, Henry IV, a great folk hero to the French people, the king who had abandoned Protestantism um, because he said, you know, France, what is it? France, Paris is worth a mass, is it? Paris is worth a Paris mass. Paris is worth a and mass, he, yeah. Also, he's very keen that every peasant should have a, a chicken in a <laughs> Exactly. Everybody loves him. Chickens and Catholicism. And uh, Bailly says to, the, to Louis, these keys were given to Henry IV. He had conquered his people 
but now it is his people who have conquered their king. I mean, who wants to hear that? So, yeah, Poor Louis, like that. smiling weakly. Um, <laughs> anyway, Lafayette is there with his with his new cockade, the new colours, red, white, and blue. I'm sure. Um, there are loads of national guards now lining the streets. They process through the streets. Market women dressed in white, making up the rear of the procession. We'll be hearing more about market women, I imagine, in the next couple of days. We will. Yeah. Um, and people are, ch- are chanting, "Not long live the king, but long live the nation, la nation." They get to the city hall, and there, there's a great banner: Louis the Sixteenth, father of the French, the king of a free people. And Dominic Key there is he's not described as the king of France. No, but of the French. So the idea that France is the property of the king yes. is gone. Exactly. Louis gets onto a throne and people make speeches. And he's and he's said to have listened with tears running down his cheeks. Of course, some people say, wonderful, tears of patriotic pride. Others say <laughs> he's he's gutted. <laughs> this is like the worst day of his life. Um, Bailly gives him a tricolour cockade, red, white, and blue, and the king sticks it in his hat and everybody cheers. But what he is thinking, we don't know. We know he got back to Versailles that night about 10 o'clock and his Marie Antoinette and his family were so worried about him. But what he said to them, what he made of it all, remains a mystery. Most people, though, at the time thought this was a truly exceptional event in history. One third estate deputy, a guy called Jean-Antoine Huguet, said it was unique in the annals of the universe to see a people that had taken up arms against their king, um, now reunited with their king in a world in which the balance of power completely changed. He says, it was reserved for the French nation to give this example to the universe. And that universalism We'll be talking about this tomorrow when you do. We will. When you yeah. get onto the, the the sort of ideological um, shift that the French Revolution represents, that universalism is so key to this whole story. There's a great source for this whole period. A book, the letters of a bookseller called Nicolas Rouault, and he wrote to his brother after this. He said, "Everything will now change: morals, opinions, laws, customs, usages, government. In very little time, we will be new men." And that, of course, is the French Revolution's appeal, the idea of starting anew and making you know, a better world. But actually, Tom, it would be, to be Burkean, I think it would be wrong to end on the note of optimism because actually the violence doesn't end with the fall of the Bastille. Something has been unleashed now, I would say, and I know this is just my own prejudice talking, but I would say something has been unleashed that will cannot now be put back in its box. And the example of this is what we began with. So seven days, one week after the fall of the Bastille, um, the, f- the food prices are still very high. And there are rumours that a, a, an official, a royal official in the war ministry called Joseph Foulon de Douai had said about the poor, let them eat straw. Whether he did say it, we do not know. A crowd grabbed him. They, they hanged him. They cut off his head. They stuffed grass and straw in his mouth and they paraded his head around the city on a pike. And then they saw his son-in-law, who was the intendant of Paris, the royal official responsible for Paris, who was Berthier de Sauvigny, the man you began with. And they, drag, they, gra- they, they grabbed him and they forced him to accompany them round the streets. They held the head of Foulon in front of him, his father-in-law, and they chanted at him, kiss papa, kiss papa. I mean, an absolutely, unbelievably horrendous scene. They got to the city hall. They killed Berthier. They tore, they literally tore the heart out of his body and threw it at the walls of the city hall. And then they put his head on a pike too alongside his father-in-law's and paraded it around. And that newspaper you mentioned, Elise Lustelot's Révolution de Paris, he, he wrote a big article about this. That's what we quoted. And Lustelot said, it's fine. They were both traitors to the nation, traitors to the people. Um, and actually, by, it's only by killing such people that Frenchmen, you will be free. And as Simon Sharma says in his book, Citizens, this isn't the end of something. This is just the beginning. When he's described these events, it's then that Sharma writes, violence was not just an unfortunate side effect of the French Revolution. It was the revolution's source of collective energy. It was violence that made the revolution revolutionary and i'm afraid there will be a lot more violence to come but 
I think worth mentioning as well, there will also be a lot more idealism and abstract nouns to come. So we will see you then. Brilliant. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.